Hello everybody, good evening and welcome back to uh, one of uh, seemingly many, many DMU live streams here on the live stream page at DMU and we're going to be talking about uh, all things to do with UCAS and fast tracking UCAS and kind of getting you through that whole UCAS process. So welcome to everybody, if you could let us know you're here by commenting in the chat uh, and obviously it's a really good place to be to pop your questions if there's anything that we can help you with during this process. My name is Ben, I'm joined by colleagues from the school and college liaison team and we're here to give you lots and lots of advice about how to apply through UCAS. Now recent developments with things like the pandemic have actually forced UCAS to push the deadline back. Typically the UCAS deadline is actually 15th of January, obviously that is a, a date that's imminently arriving but now UCAS have actually pushed that date to January the 29th I believe so that means that now you've got even more time if you are thinking of going to university to spend a bit longer actually researching your options and actually going through the whole UCAS process and that's exactly what we're going to talk about this evening. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about what UCAS is, we're going to talk you through uh, some key dates and key deadlines to be aware of and then what we're also going to do is just talk to you a little bit about things like the personal statement, the application process and what happens after you've sent all those applications off. So we'll spend that over the next 40 minutes. And as I say, if you do have any questions at all, do pop those into the comments and we'll try and do our best to answer those during this session. Okay, so let's kick this off really quickly. Let's get straight into it. I'm gonna hand over to Dow first of all, who's gonna tell us exactly what UCAS is. If you're unfamiliar with the whole process, starting right, right from basics, Dow, what is UCAS? Um, so UCAS, um, first of all, stands for Universities uh, College Admission Service, and it's the central hub for all undergraduate applications. So right now, if you're in a position whereby you haven't even looked at UCAS, you haven't even thought about anything prior to, to come into university, please do not panic. You can utilize this live stream um, to help kickstart that journey and, and sort of fast track your application into university. But UCAS is your starting point. So it has tons of information on there for you. So you can have a look at the different universities, you can have a look at the different courses, and it's all done on this UCAS website. When you come to actually filling out your application form, which you still would have to do if you want to apply for the university, it would be done through UCAS. And it has a lot of resources on there to, to sort of guide you and help you along in that journey. Also, if you have a look on our website, I'm sure we'll post the link in a second, um, we've done previous live streams that have covered the UCAS process in depth. So you can have a look at those if you are struggling for different areas in the, the UCAS journey. Please do refer to one of those videos to help you. But UCAS, just generally speaking, is that central hub. It has over 50,000 courses, has over 250 different institutions. And it sort of makes your job a bit tricky when you have to sort of narrow that down to, to five choices. But if you need any information around the courses or the different universities, please do start at UCAS. In particular, look at the UCAS search icon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good start, actually. So UCAS, uh, just sort of more broadly, and as, as Dal said there, with loads and loads of live streams and resources available on the website, just do head over to the web page if you're not already uh, sat on that web page right now, uh, and use those tools and use those resources and use those talks that we've offered uh, to kind of explore more about this. Because again, this is going to be quite a, um, I guess it's a fast track into UCAS, and this is going to be quite a fast track uh, sort of live stream. So we're not going to be able to go into loads and loads of detail about certain topics today. But certainly when you are, if you are at those very, very initial stages uh, and you don't even sort of know what the UCAS website is, it's a really, really good place to kind of do that research and actually look into those different university courses. And um, whilst we're on the kind of subject of research, if we are scaling it all the way back to the kind of first parts of those timeline, um, starting with yourself, Dow, sort of key research points for university, if we can touch on those really, really quickly, what students can do to make sure they make the most out of this little bit of extra time so they can make an informed decision? Yeah, so we have an open day coming up um, this Saturday. And for me, that would be my first port of call for you guys. So if you did want to find out more information about the university, if you wanted to have a, a bit more of an in-depth look at the courses um, in terms of the modules, the different teaching assessments, please do visit the link that's flashed up on the screen because you mm -hmm. can, there is still time to register. So it's very, very important now that you're utilising this window up until the 29th of January to do as much research as you possibly can. Have a look at what the course is, have a look at the entry criteria. Are you doing the right qualifications to sort of suit that course that you want to go into? Have you looked at different employers 
that the university or the course might associate itself with, do they offer you a placement window? So please do try and gain as much information as you possibly can by either visiting things like open days or getting in touch generally with the university. So I know us, we communicate on a number of platforms. So you can get in touch with us via WhatsApp. You can get in touch with us via our website or even Unibuddy. So there's a lot of ways that you can get in touch, get the questions in, and hopefully we'll be able to help you in regards to you guys making a strong application. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Really keeping me on my toes with all these links, uh, Dal, here. Uh, but you should have them preloaded, Ben. <laughs> I thought you'd be there right away as soon as I said it. Boom, put it on the screen. I'm on it. I'm on it. And there will be links in the comments. So if there's any of the things that we're talking about today, so I've just put a link for the open days in the comments there as well. You'll be able to jump onto those if you do want to go and explore a bit further as the session goes on or at the end of the session. And um, so, Nikila, over to yourself just to quickly before we move on to the next topic. So casting your minds back to when you were kind of doing that university research, what kind of things were you looking at for the university that you ultimately chose to go to? I mainly looked at the city and um, with my degree, it was only offered at very limited universities. So I didn't have a crazy amount of choice. So when I was making my choices, I looked at, you know, at the cities that universities were in, were they affordable, what was the transport like, what was the accommodation like? These are the types of things that I looked into. Um, and my course didn't really vary from university to university because there were set things that you had to learn. So I didn't have that much in terms of choice. Um, but if you're choosing something like a degree in history, that would vary massively from university university so it's really important that you look at the course content and make sure it is tailored to your own interest and something that you want to go into and um, that would be my advice to you lovely and uh, last but certainly not least good evening Henrik any advice from yourself um yeah I think personally casting my mind back you know looking a long a long while ago now um one of the biggest things that, are, that maybe you know stumbled upon my decision was looking at the sort of social aspect of mm. the university and the sort of extracurricular stuff that you can get get involved with so things like um sport was really important to me so you know i picked a university that was good for a sport especially things like rugby in particular um and i think you know that's really important i think it's quite often overlooked as well when students are you know doing their research they focus you know obviously it's really important to have a look at the course have a look at the league tables and that kind of thing but ultimately I personally think anyway that, you know, you should get involved with as much opportunities as you can while you're at uni. You don't mm -hmm. want to be, you know, stuck with your head in a book or in the library for the whole, the whole, you know, three, four years. So have a look at what other things you can get involved with, whether that's trips abroad, sports team societies, work experience, that kind of thing. And, you know, then once you've sort of figured everything out, then you can start to make like an informed choice. Perfect. Thank you. And I think that's all really good advice, whether you are at those early stages or whether you are um, a little bit further, you know, further along and you have actually kind of decided maybe it is what, what you want to study. But have you thought about things like the sports teams and the societies? If you are really at that kind of early stage where you're not even sure what you want to do, Dow's advice about the UCAS website is going to be brilliant because there's so many resources on there and it's a really good place to just start uh, looking at what courses are out there and what universities are available. So brilliant. So we'll move uh, very, very swiftly on into the kind of next stages. So we're going to talk on some uh, key deadlines and key dates that you need to just be aware of um, as we kind of move forward. Now, of course, obviously, as we've mentioned, the UCAS deadline is in January. That has been pushed to the end of January. So you have got that little bit more time to um, actually make those applications. Now, we say that like it's a very hard deadline. And typically, this is referred to as a, an equal consideration deadline. So what that means is essentially universities will consider all applications before this date um, equally. Now, you can still apply after that January deadline. That's absolutely fine. Obviously, for those more competitive courses um, or those courses with you know fewer spaces, that sort of thing, you may find that those spaces fill up a lot quicker if you apply after that deadline and you may not be able to get a place on those types of courses if you apply after that deadline. So we advise students to try and get their applications in before this January deadline. As I say, now you've got that little bit more time to just get your applications in if you are thinking of applying um, for September this year. So that's just one thing to worth mentioning. Um, UCAS Extra will open, we'll, we'll touch on that um, very, very shortly, and that will be in February. Of course, Student Finance also opens normally late Feb. Um, the date for that changes every single year. So if you are applying now, student finance is something else to be aware of and getting your student finance application in early is really important. Again, we're not gonna to touch too much on student finance today, but stay tuned on the live stream page that I put in the comments because there will be a student finance live stream coming up um, around the February time. So we'll be able to remind you that way. 
Um, the final deadline for in May is for universities to get their offers back to you. So if you have applied to your five chosen universities and you've got those in before that January deadline, then by May 20th, universities should have their uh, offers back to you as to whether they are willing to take you as a student at that university. So you should hear back from all universities, hopefully, by around May. And then obviously, if you have been given those offers, you've then got until a date in June, I believe it's the 10th, to should decide on which your uh, which of those five choices is going to be your firm and which is going to be your insurance. So from those five options that you've put on your UCAS application, your firm choice will be the one that you really want to go to and your insurance is kind of your backup. And as I say, we'll touch on that uh, a little bit later as well. The other three choices on your UCAS application are then discarded. So you've got to make sure that you're making, again, those really informed decisions. Of course, from there, you've got obviously until August until you find out your results. Um, and what was the date for the August results? Results day, did we find that out earlier? So I the think it's back, hasn't it? Uh, possibly, yeah. So that date is TBC at the moment. End of August rather than mid August, like it normally is. Possibly. So you'll know in August when it comes to your results day as to what you've actually got. And that will also give you a really good idea uh, as to whether you have actually got your place at that university. And that's where universities will start to secure those offers when they start to receive uh, the grades from you. And of course, then by September, hopefully you should be starting university. So those are just some key dates that we just wanted to mention here, um, it, it particularly as part of that kind of UCAS process as to where you are now and where we are in the timeline right now and where you will be in uh, a few months time. So that's all those kind of dates key dates covered off the back of the kind of UCAS process. So some of the things I mentioned there when I've talked about things like choices and talking about the sort of application process, I'm gonna hand over to Henrik uh, to talk us through a little bit more about how the actual UCAS process works. Cool, thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, so the application process itself for UCAS is pretty straightforward. Um, it is done pretty much all online. Um, so as I said before, um, you know, the UCAS website will be a central hub. You'll have a login and that's where, you know, you'll apply you'll check the status of your application and so on. Um, so what you do is you'll create an account with UCAS. So it'd be www.ucas.com forward slash apply. You'll make a username and a password. Obviously you want to keep this somewhere safe um, because you obviously you need this to log in if you want to check the updates of your applications, which no doubt you will numerous times while you're waiting to hear back from all your choices and that kind of thing. Um, if you are applying through um, say a school or a college, um, you'll have a buzzword. Um, and that will link your application to your school or college. So if you're not too sure about that, um, have a chat with either your personal tutor, uh, your form teacher, your careers advisor, so on. They'll be able to sort that out for you. And then what you'll do is, um, obviously, as Ben said before, you get your five choices. Um, you do send the same application to all five choices. So we do need to reiterate that. So you don't write five different personal statements and send off five different applications. You write one personal statement, you make one application, but it gets sent to five unis or five different courses, however you want to do it. Um, unfortunately, there is a small fee for UCAS. So if you want to apply for just one choice, which you can, that is £20. Um, but we do advise, you know, you take your full advantage of the opportunity to apply to five choices, which is um, £25. Um, and then the actual application itself, just sort of talking about that. Um, it is made up of a few different sections. So when you do put them all together, you can then send your application off. But to start with, the easiest part is just going to be, you know, general admin, pop in your name, email address, ethnic origin, nationality, so on, that kind of thing. Then you're going to start to talk about, or you can start to um, choose your university choices. So, you know, hopefully you've done your research, you've decided what course you want to apply to, what university you want to apply to, and then you select them, you make the application. They're not in... Um, a rank order, so they are completely anonymous. So the other universities don't sort of see where you've applied to. So that's just for your own personal knowledge. Um, and then you'll pop in any academic qualifications or predicted grades. Um, if you have any paid work experience as well, you'll pop that in there, but it's not essential. Um, and then one of the final points, one of the most important points is you will need a reference. So if you are still at school or college, um, you should be able to get this from your tutor or your teacher. If you are a mature learner and you've left school or college, um, UCAS and most universities will take some sort of professional reference. So maybe your boss, your line manager, they can write your reference up. You can get that put on your profile and you can apply with that as well. Um, and then it's obviously the last part, probably the most important part, which is the, the dreaded personal statement. And then obviously once you've got all that together, you can send off your application and it's just a little bit of a waiting game. Perfect. 
Thank you. And I think, again, the point that you made there about your five choices, I think that links back to the sort of research points that we're making before is, as you say, it's not in rank order. You don't put your favourite one at the top and then your second favourite, second, etc. You know, they, these are five choices. There can be five sort of simultaneous choices. You know, they're kind of similar in your mind, but you've still got to make that kind of decision when it narrows down to your sort of firm and your insurance choice, which is, say, we'll, we'll touch on a little bit later. So that's really important. And, and really, as, as we go into talking about the personal statement with Nikita in a second, reaffirming that it is the same application that goes to all five of your choices, again, is really important because, um, and, and as we'll talk about with the statement in a second, you know, it's going to be the pe same personal statement that you send for all five. So the reason why this is important is your five choices need to be very reflective of each other. Um, if you're going to choose five different courses, that's going to make it very difficult to write the same personal statement for all five. So this is why we want to reaffirm that now is you need to kind of narrow down your choices so that you are within a similar course field enough that that personal statement is going to be reflective of those five choices. But equally, you can then look to apply for similar courses at the same university if there's a certain amount of overlap. So if you're finding that actually, you know, there's two courses at one university you want to apply to that are very, very similar, there might only be slight module differences, and that does happen, um, that might be one option for you. But typically we suggest obviously putting a, a bit of a range on your courses, don't put all your eggs in one basket when you're making those applications. So yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Henrik. Over to Nikila then, who's going to talk about that dreaded personal statement and, and give us a little bit of an overview on that. Thank you. So, yeah, as Ben said, you can only write one personal statement. So that will go to up to five of the university choices. Um, and you really should be using this personal statement as an opportunity to sell yourself to the university. You want to let them know why you're passionate about the course, why you've chosen the course, why you think you're suitable for the course. And that's primarily what the universities are looking for. They're not looking for some expert knowledge, um, particularly if it's a course that you've not studied previously. For instance, I did a degree in optics. Obviously, I'd never studied optics prior to this. They didn't expect me to have complete knowledge because if you have that knowledge why would you then be doing a degree in it mainly what they want to see you have the passion you have the understanding and that you'll be motivated to complete the course is, is really what they're looking for and um, so universities will be using your personal statement to make a decision on your application bear in mind that for most courses you don't have an interview so this is the only real insight that they have into you um, in comparison to another applicant so particularly for competitive courses um, when all students meet the entry criteria all they really have to differentiate you from another student is your personal statement so it's really important that you get across your personality and why you think you would be a good applicant um, so that you are selling yourself and perhaps giving yourself that edge over another applicant who has the exact same criteria as you in terms of entry uh, requirements so this is really how you can get yourself to have that little bit of extra edge. Um, in terms of the personal statement itself, it sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot. It's 4,000 characters or 47 lines, and that's the maximum that you can submit into the UCAS platform. So um, my top tip would be to write it into a Word document first, and then that way you've got your spelling and grammar and everything checked in there, and then copy that over into the UCAS platform, because if it crashes, and it does crash quite a bit, you will lose anything you've worked on. Um, so definitely don't make that mistake. Um, in terms of how to structure the personal statement, we're not going to go into this too much because um, we do hold the live streams on personal statements themselves. Uh, but just to give you a bit of an overview, in terms of the personal statement, we recommend that you start off with a really engaging open paragraph. Um, first impressions do mean everything, and that's in all walks of life, and it does include your personal statement. Just make sure that it's something that's snappy and original and just not too much of a cliche or you've not been born knowing that you want to be an optician or known from the minute you were born that you wanted to speak English that's not an accurate representation so just make sure it's not a cliched start and that's all really you can ask with yourself and um, in terms of what you need to include explain as I said your choice of course so why you've chosen the course why you're suitable for the course um, and anything that you have completed or any experiences that you have that make you suitable and and why they're suitable so for instance um, if you have work experience or you've completed EPQ or you have hobbies or you've volunteered or you have work experience anything that you can draw on in your personal life that would set you apart from another applicant that makes you you and makes you suitable is worthwhile mentioning here and it's also really important that not only do you mention something but you relate it back to why that makes you suitable for the course so for instance if you say that you play a sport they don't just want to hear that you play a sport they want to hear why that's relevant so for instance I don't know say if you're looking to study medicine and you do I don't know uh, you do football um mm -hmm you can say that that makes you a good team player and that allows you to appreciate different strengths within a team 
that would make it something worthwhile mentioning as you do often work within a multidisciplinary team within medicine. So it's something that you need to think about. Um, think about how to flip things around in terms of how someone reading it who wants to know why you're suitable would want to hear about these things, not just tick box exercises, I do X, Y, and Z, because they want to hear more about that. Um, in terms of the content, um, we would then recommend that you have a conclusion um, which would go over things like your aspirations, your future plans, what you hope to get out of university. So, for instance, if you are studying a set degree to get here afterwards, let them know what your aspirations are so that they can see that you do have a real understanding of where the degree can take you. And that will definitely appeal to uh, people who are reading your personal statements. Um, in terms of how to lay it out, we would say about two thirds of your personal statements should be about the subject and your suitability. And then a final third would be any relevant work experience or voluntary experiences that you have, extracurricular activities. And um, I think definitely don't be afraid to sing your own praises. It can be quite awkward to be sitting there talking about yourself, um, but it is essentially what they're there for. So you don't need to be humble in this one instance. This is really the time to sell yourself. Brilliant. I mean, that was an uh, absolute whistle stop tour through personal statements there. It was, uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot to cover with a personal statement and we could, I mean, we have done whole streams where we talked for like a solid hour just about the personal statement. So uh you know it's the same it's a shame that we can't obviously kind of cover that all today but i do want to go over to uh the guys as well so dow first of all and just again give your tips your impressions because i know you've read quite a lot of personal statements back in the day so uh, any thoughts adding to what nikila's just talked about no nikila smashed it quite, yeah. quite well smashed she's, it. she's not left anything else for anyone else to say no the only thing that i would say is um have a look very very deeply into your skill set and your attributes. I know it might sound very simple, but sometimes that's the hardest part to convey. Um, what you've got to understand is, is that this document, as Nikila was saying, is our only representation of you. So we don't get to know you as people. We don't get to have a conversation with you prior to your application or anything like that. We're going to make our judgment based on what you put in this form. So it's very, very important that you understand what your key skills are and what your key qualities are, because that in actual fact is what's going to separate you from candidate A to candidate B. Now, I know in, a, an, in her example, Nikila mentioned teamwork and cooperation in the example that she gave with football, but I strongly urge you to look a bit deeper than that as well. So it's absolutely fine that you have these core skills of being able to communicate and being able to work in the team, but also look a bit deeper and have a look um, in regards to your to your academic work, think about the academic skills that you guys have developed and how that will be useful for you when you transition into university. So have a look at your, your analytical nature, for example, your ability to read and think critically. Those types of skills are going to be fundamental for you to being successful at university. And the real crux of the whole thing is by is being able to write it in a way that you can really bring your work to life. So provide us with a short example, explain why that's relevant to either to the course area or to the field or, or to university in itself. But for me, my biggest tip is work out what your key skills are, what makes you different, because everything else, and as Nikila was saying, it's easy to put them in. This is where I'm, this, these are the skills that I've developed in my academics. These are the skills I've developed in my work experience or my voluntary work, or whatever it is that you guys have done. But if, you do, if you're not quite sure of what your key skills are, that for me is probably where it becomes a bit difficult. Awesome. Yeah, I think, again, really good example there. Just the, developing on more of those skills and then analytical is a brilliant one because obviously that comes into quite a lot of, uh, of sort of university courses uh, and a lot of the university courses, these studies that you do. So, yeah, brilliant. Henrik, anything uh, additional from yourself? We already know Nikhil has smashed it, but is there anything <laughs> else that the guys have uh, forgotten to mention? Um, my, I wouldn't say anything about adding or, you know, leaving anything out. Mine's more of a little tip just to maybe get you started. Um, you know, I think we've all maybe sat there and tried to write, whether it's a personal statement or an essay or a job application, and it's really hard just to get words on the paper sometimes. Um, so just a little tip for writing a personal statement. Um, sometimes uh, what you might find is the, the introduction or the first paragraph is the hardest one to write because you don't know where to start especially for something like a personal statement where you're singing your own praises, um, it can be really difficult, um, you know, to, you know, to write without trying to sound too big headed or, you know, sell yourself that kind of thing. So just, I think a little, little useful tip is to, if you are someone that struggles with things like introductions and that kind of thing, just maybe skip that, go straight to the main body, 
start talking through the, all the bits that Nikila mentioned. And then maybe once you've actually got the main chunk of your personal statement written down, it might make the introduction a little bit easier because in that introduction, you really want to sort of cut to the chase, get straight to the course that you're interested in, maybe a little brief introduction as to why you want to apply for it. Um, and that can sometimes be the hardest part to write for most people. So by skipping that and then doing it at the end, you might find it's actually a little bit easier. Yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, you know, those opening paragraphs, they, they are difficult, they are tricky to nail. And, and I know, Dow, you've had you've had some examples, as I say, looking at personal statements. And sometimes they, that, that opening paragraph can sometimes make or break how, yeah. I mean, you've got to read all of them, ultimately. And I know you did, Dow, don't tell me lies. But sometimes it can really make a difference to how much you're going to enjoy that and how much yeah. the, the reader is going to draw you in. Do you have any final tips for, for sort of kicking it off and getting those personal, that, that opening paragraph sort of nailed? Yeah. Yeah, to sort of drum home what Ben's trying to trying to say there is is that if we just be quite frankly for a moment, if there is a large number of applicants applying for a course, so let's just my maths wasn't my maths wasn't always a strong point for me, so I'm going to try and keep it very simple. Um, let's just say there was hundred spaces available and there's five hundred students who've applied. Now, obviously, we have an obligation to read and judge every application fairly, so that's so I have to say that. Um, but if your personal statement falls luckily on the top of the poll and, and we read it first and it doesn't really quite capture our attention, in the back of our minds, we're sort of thinking that, you know, we've got 499 other statements to get through here. So maybe I'll just read that one a little bit later. So that for me, speaking from my own um, experience, was the most important thing. So for me, it has to capture my attention. So mm -hmm. if that opening line so Nikila referred to a few cliches I've always wanted to be a dentist since I was a child or something like that along those lines if it is too cliche sometimes it's not the most interesting it's not the most engaging so one thing that I would always strongly recommend you guys to do is to demonstrate the knowledge that you guys have immediately so what one of the common mistakes people might make is that they might think that this is a, a biographical account in terms of you're trying to tell me your life story in actual fact, I just want you to go straight to the point. So you're applying to pharmacy. So tell me what your knowledge of pharmacy is. And sometimes it's a lot easier then to link all your work together. So, if, for example, if you can give me a brief description or an overview of what pharmacy means to you, you can then tell me where you access that information from. And nine times out of ten, it's going to come from your education. Oh, I do A levels in biology or chemistry, for example. That's where I learned to round that definition or a broad definition of what I believe pharmacy is. And I feel like it's a great way of writing because it helps to cut away the waffle. It helps to cut away a bit of the storytelling, but it is vitally important in that opening line that you yeah. really do capture the reader's attention. Lovely. Yeah, and we are, we are going to move on from personal statements very shortly because we have got other things to get through. But the points that all these guys have made is that it's very, very important. It can be quite tricky, but being able to nail that and doing a good personal statement is, is, is going to be super important to making sure that you get onto those courses, particularly and some of the name checked courses that we've had here, medicine, pharmacy, um, are quite competitive and there'll be an awful lot of students that'll be applying for those. And it will sometimes come down to the experience and your the information you include on that statement. So yeah, really, really important. So very, very key. Uh, so thank you. But well, let's move on from statements because we could get wrapped in this uh, for the rest of the stream. We'll be here all evening. Um, so Dan, I'm going to go back over to you again, I'm afraid. Um, you're going to be the chatty one of this stream and you're going to tell us what happens after the, the, the application gets sent off. Yeah, sure. So from the moment that you've finished your personal statement, uh, you've got someone to check it, your school or college, or if you're going through it independently, you've checked over your UCAS application, you've hit submit. And then what happens at the point of hitting submit is that UCAS will then automatically send a copy of your application to your chosen universities. As Henrik mentioned in the application process, the other universities will not know who your other choices are. It will be sent anonymously and it will only be sent to that university that you've applied for. So we can't see who else you've applied for. Um, we will then assess your application. So this might take a couple of months. So if you stick to the deadlines, um, you'll, probably, you'll probably be looking to hear back around March, April time. Uh, if you've chosen a course that requires a portfolio, so it could be a design related course um, where you have to show a body of work, um, you will be asked for a, for a portfolio so universities will get in touch with you to say right can you send this portfolio in 
And if you're applying predominantly speaking to health and life sciences or health and social science type courses, uh, you may be invited to interview. Now, with all that's happening in the world currently, it's not suitable for us to conduct face-to-face -face uh, interviews. So these interviews will be conducted digitally and it will be done online just to make sure everyone is safe. From there, you can always keep in touch with your UCAS track to find out the progress of your application. So as soon as a university makes any changes or makes any amendments to your to your application, you will be notified via UCAS track. So it's very, very important that you keep your username and password safe as you'll be referring to it throughout the whole process. Lovely, thank you very much. And we're gonna get on to talking a little bit about offers in a second. Um, we have just had a, a comment come through, so I'm going to very, very quickly address that. If anybody does have any questions during this stream about the UCAS process, do pop them in the comments. If it's something we can answer, we'll obviously do our best to do so. Um, but just very, very quickly, Nikila, I think you said you know the answer to this one. Um, so can you reset UCAT and can you still get accepted for medical school? Yeah, so the reason why I know this is because my sister sat this exam for her dentistry application. Um, right. but basically, with UCAT, some universities consider it more than others do so my advice would be if you're not satisfied with your score and you think perhaps i could have done better in this my advice would be look at the different universities that you've applied for some universities weigh this more than others do so it's best to get in touch with the admissions team in each university that you're looking to apply for and find out will this affect my application negatively or is this a suitable score? Bear in mind that obviously this year we've had a very turbulent year. Universities, even medical schools are going to have to be a bit more accepting of the fact that perhaps you've not had the support or the face-to-face -face learning that perhaps would have given you a bit more support this year. So they might be a bit more understanding. Don't quote me on this and we don't have a medical school at our university, but I just want to say it, there might be a bit of flexibility there. Um, and also, as I say, just to look at universities that perhaps might not consider UCAT as much as your entry criteria or personal statement, work experience, etc. See what kind of weighting they put into that. And um, so, as I say, contact the universities themselves, see if they think that that would be a suitable minimum score. If it isn't, um, I don't think there's any harm in resitting. Most people that apply to medical school do not get in first attempt. A lot of medical students are actually mature students who have perhaps um, taken a bit of time out or who have and um, taking a bit of time out and done another degree and come back to university there are so many different pathways into medicine these days it's not straight and forward as though and if you think about it an 18 year old doesn't necessarily have the most experience in terms of work experience particularly this year when getting work experience within the medical field is near enough impossible due to covid so don't let yourself be disheartened there are definitely other options down the line and um in terms of your resolve it does show that you are very committed if you are willing to reset your UCAT score and if you do score higher the second time it just goes to show you're learning from your mistakes that you've you've changed your uh, studying style or something like that and that perhaps will work in your favor so my advice overall would be to contact individual universities that you're looking to apply for and see what their advice would be brilliant thank you very much because uh, i have to be honest personally I don't know anything about that because, as I say, DMU unfortunately doesn't offer a medical school. So I'm really glad uh, we've got Nikila here, who could be our wealth of knowledge in that area. But uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, and as I say, if anybody does have anything else uh, sort of uh, UCAS related or anything like that, pop them in there and we'll see if we can do our best to answer them. Uh, so Dale was talking very briefly there about uh, what happens when you click go on that application, what happens when it all gets sent off. Hopefully, once the universities have received them, you've got past the point of requiring anything such as an interview or a portfolio or an audition, uh, as to say, as Dal mentioned, universities should start to get back to you regarding some offers. Henrik, I wonder whether you could run through what those offers are. Yeah, so I will fast forward a couple of months uh, and hopefully all, as Ben said, all the universities will start getting back to you. Uh, you're probably looking at between sort of February, March, that sort of time. Um, potentially into into May, um, but the different offers you will get. So the typical one will be a conditional offer. Now that is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it means that the university is willing to offer you a place on the course, albeit you meet the conditions of that offer, which is that you you meet the entry requirements for that course, or you pass a particular um, grade for a certain course, or something along those lines. Um, Another offer that you might receive is an unconditional offer. Uh, and what that means is that the university are willing to offer you a place on that course, irrespective of what your, your outcomes are, what your grades are. So they like you so much as a candidate. Maybe your predictive grades were really strong. Your application, your UCAS application, your personal statement was really strong. You had a glowing reference from your tutor. 
and they're willing to make you an unconditional offer or you're someone that's going to university a little bit later you've already sat your exams you have those qualifications ready to hand you can apply with them uh, and you might get an unconditional offer um what we do typically say with unconditional offers are they're not an excuse to take your foot off the gas you do have to continue working um I need to caveat that i guess with the recent um you know update from um, from the government um that obviously they're going to be using teacher assessed grades predicted grades so they're going to be probably something potentially a little bit similar um i think it's going to be a case of you know watch this space um regarding things like unconditional offers but up until now um they were sort of growing in popularity i guess um you might also be offered something called alternative course offer now what that might mean is uh, let's give you an example of let's say you applied for something like pharmacy uh, and maybe you didn't quite have uh, the chemistry a level that you need um so they might say that, you know, maybe you're a better suited to something like uh, pharmaceutical and cosmetic science. Now, what that just basically means is that the university, you know, maybe you're not quite a good fit, uh, quite the right fit for the full pharmacy course, but you're, you know, you're close to it. You can do something that's loosely related in a similar field. Now, you don't have to accept that. That's totally up to you. Um, you have all the right in the world to accept to apply on that if it's something that gets offered to you. Um, and then obviously you might be um, declined as well. So hopefully that's not the case. That doesn't happen. Um, but in 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 scenario of you, if you do receive a decline, um, what it just means is that you know the university decides that you're maybe not the best fit for that course that you've applied to. Maybe your predicted grades aren't quite what they're looking for, or maybe your personal statement isn't the sort of thing that matches up with the expectations of that course. Now, hopefully, let's just say you you heard back from all five of your offers. They've offered you five uh, conditional offers. Um, then it's essentially up to you to decide which one you want to make your firm choice. Now, that's your your ultimate choice that's the choice you want to go to the most that's your number one choice and then you also get to make a insurance choice and now that's more of a sort of safety net um a, an option to fall back on if things don't quite go to plan come results day for your firm choice um and that's totally up to you so you can you can decide which one you want to make your firm which one you make your insurance and then as ben said at the beginning once you've done that you get to then disregard three of your offers they get thrown away and then you focus on your firm choice and then you also like I mentioned you've got that um that safety net from your insurance choice if you have to use it come results day um and you know you should have heard back from all the universities by uh, the middle of may um and then it's just a case of you decide what you want to do next once you've made your firm choice it is worth then maybe looking at things like applying to student finance and um getting in contact with the universities um, to book things like accommodation if you are looking to move out and that kind of thing. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. And, and as I say, we mentioned student finance before, and obviously that's a really important one. With student finance opening, typically, um, sort of, it's usually the end of Feb, early March. They tend to just drop it on us like the week before. Um, so with student finance opening around then, if you've already got your offers back very early, if you get them back within you know a week or a couple of weeks time, you can then obviously make your firm choice and you'll be able to then obviously do your student finance. Uh, but I would just say, as soon as you've got your offers and as soon as you've made your firm choice, definitely uh, jump on student finance as soon as you can. And also obviously jump onto things like accommodation and that sort of thing. And as Henrik mentioned, um, unconditional offers, there was a few changes in the previous year uh, surrounding those. We're not quite sure what the sort of full story is around those at the minute. So you might find, find those get phased out or they're, they're less common um, over the coming years, but it's just worth us mentioning it here. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Henrik. That's uh, all the stuff around the sort of offer making side of things if you apply by this January deadline or shortly afterwards. What we're now going to talk about for the last little part of this uh, live stream before we wrap up is sort of UCAS Extra results day and clearing. And UCAS Extra is an opportunity uh, for students to essentially get an additional offer on their UCAS application. And I'm going to hand over to Nikila uh, to talk a little bit more about that. Perfect, thank you. So. UCAS Extra is something that confuses a lot of students and I'll be honest I had no idea what it was when I was in uni well applying for uni so you're not alone there if you've never even heard of it before so in essence what UCAS Extra is is if you have been unsuccessful with all five of your choices or you have changed your mind about the course or university that you want to go to you can add only one extra choice through UCAS now there's no additional cost to this so if you've already paid £25 for your maximum of five choices UCAS considers this within that cost so there's nothing else extra to pay and um, just so you're aware of the timeline of this it opens at the end of February until July of the year that you're applying for so it will open in February of this year and it will close in July of this year 
Now, you can only, I, I can't stress this enough, use this if you've used all five of your choices. So, for instance, if you had only made the one choice and you have an opportunity to choose four more, you're not eligible for UCAS Extra. You just need to add an extra choice on UCAS. Um, you can't be holding any other offers if you make this. So, for instance, say if you have made five choices and you've accepted your family insurance and you want to completely change your mind you would need to contact these universities and be withdrawn from your application there before you can add an extra choice on UCAS so because of that we really really do stress you need to contact the new university that you're hoping to apply for to make sure that they can make you an offer because you do run the risk of withdrawing your other university choices and then not getting another offer and then the previous universities if you go back to them say actually we've now filled our places you can't be accepted here either and you kind of put yourself in a really tricky position so be proactive contact the new university first make sure that you have it in writing that they can give you an offer and then go ahead and make your changes um, and just make sure you're making good choices because it's obviously very difficult to reverse once you've gone ahead with this um yeah so the additional thing is that we do need to let you know is that you can't change your personal statement. So if, for instance, you have a complete change of heart and you want to change your course entirely, um, you aren't normally able to submit a new personal statement. So if, for instance, you want to study philosophy and then you change your mind and think, no, I want to do maths now, you won't be able to submit a new personal statement. However, some universities, if you contact them and ask them very nicely and speak to their admissions team, will allow you perhaps to submit a new personal statement because they understand, obviously, um, people do have a change of heart and it's actually a good thing that you realise now rather than being in the course of two years that you actually do want to change your mind. So if you ask nicely and you go about it correctly, you may be able to submit an additional personal statement, but do contact the university first to see if that is an option because it would be such a waste of your time to go ahead, write this huge personal statement if they say, actually, it's okay, you've gone for business studies to accounting and finance, it's not that much of a jump, will accept your original personal statement, uh, so that was original personal statement, so you don't need to write a new one there, so just speak with the university first. Um, another piece of advice that we'd probably like to share is that you should find out why you've been unsuccessful with your application, so say if you've applied for a particular university, and um, five university choices, and all five of them rejected you, and you're not quite sure why, it might be something as simple as you don't meet the GCSE criteria, so for instance, on our nursing courses, you do have to have a minimum of a C grade in both English and Math GCSE, or functional skills level two at grade pass. And if you don't meet those basic requirements, something that might not seem very significant to you, you will not be accepted onto the course because it's a massive requirement for the course and something that we can't unfortunately get around. So it might be that perhaps your A-levels or your um, BTECs meet the criteria, but something simple like that doesn't meet the criteria. So if you contact the universities and find out why you've not been successful, it will mean you're not wasting your time or wasting an additional UCAS extra choice on something that you have no hopes of getting into without mm -hmm. even taking the GCSEs, for instance, or doing something additional. So definitely contact the universities and find out what it is that you were lacking in your original applications. Perfect. And as I say, UCAS Extra is, is something additional on the application that's worth noting. And we are going to touch very, very briefly on clearing in just a moment as well. So, uh, yeah, UCAS Extra is a really good opportunity if you are unsuccessful to potentially look at an additional offer or, as Nikita says, to add that additional offer if you decide actually you're not happy with the offers that you've been given, particularly if you're maybe the top couple of universities that you were hoping to go to, um, maybe you didn't get an offer for, but then maybe the other three were just kind of extras that you put in there just to kind of hedge your bets, but you weren't that interested in. You could use that to continue your research, look at some additional universities and make that additional option uh, on that UCAS application. So it is a good service and it's worth just knowing about for um, a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to touch really quickly on results day and then we're going to finish off this live stream talking about uh, clearing, which will tie into some of the stuff that the has talked about there with UCAS Extra. Really, all I want to say around results day is um, just be prepared to kind of be a little bit on it on the day. Just make sure that you have got access to a computer or to a phone or to a laptop. Um, in the eventuality that something may go wrong. Now, if everything goes right on results day and you actually get into the university that you want to go to, brilliant. You don't really have to do an awful lot else at that stage. You'll be contacted by the university that you made your firm choice for those kind of additional next steps. It might be booking certain things. It might be uh, filling out some paperwork, whatever it may be for that university. But results day is really important in case there's any eventualities or any changes that need to be made due to 
something, as I say, potentially going wrong if you don't quite get the grades that you need uh, for your conditional offer, that sort of thing. Now, as Henrik talked about earlier with the UCAS application, you'll be able to log into UCAS Track from eight o'clock on results day and actually be able to see what you achieved and actually be able to see whether you've got that place at that university. Um, so you'll be able to go onto there and actually make sure that you have got your firm offer. So at that stage, obviously, that's brilliant. You don't need to necessarily worry about that too much. My advice at this stage, if there is something that you want to change or perhaps, as I say, you don't get the offer that you needed for results day, then collecting your results from college, whatever that looks like in a pandemic, whether that be um, you're actually allowed to go into college to do that or whatever it might be at that stage. Hopefully, fingers crossed, everything is back to normal come August. Um, from that stage when you've picked up your results, you will actually be able to contact universities directly in similar format to what Nikita was talking about there with UCAS Extra and be made an offer over the phone, a verbal offer over the phone, which you will then be able to put onto your UCAS application as a clearing offer. Um, we'll talk more about that in just a second. So that's how you kind of go through that process and that's how you kind of check that process and how you actually get yourself those offers if for whatever reason you don't make it into your firm choice or your insurance choice. So that's what clearing does for you at that stage. Now you can obviously contact universities, particularly if you don't get into your firm, but you do meet the criteria for your insurance and that will allow them to confirm that your offer has gone through with that insurance choice, uh, with your insurance choice on your UCAS application. Um, and generally university phone lines are open quite early on results day. Uh, we all know, because we've all worked on clearing uh, last year and the year before, um, and we've all been up at sort of six o'clock uh, answering the phone lines very, very early that day. So it's very important that if there are any changes or any worries or there's anything like that, you, you do contact the university just to make sure that you secure your places as soon as you can. Now, there is a, a flip side to this whole thing, and it's called adjustment. If you do better than you anticipated, you can actually contact universities and look to um, trade up some of your courses for something else. So if you've got a higher grade from what you achieved for your firm choice, you could look at other universities with higher grade tariffs and actually see if they've still got places on those courses as well. So there's a really good positive side to things like results day and clearing because it does allow you to kind of explore those additional options if you do better than you anticipated. I'm going to hand over to Dow because there's quite a lot of links with um, results day and clearing. And I think it's really important that we just identify a few of those final points for those students that are sat at this stage. They might be last minute applicants. They might not be sure what they want to do. Um, so just exploring the idea of clearing. I've already seeded the idea, but I'm going to hand over to Dow to kind of uh, finish things off. Sure. So with clearing, it sort of has like a a negative connotation so a lot of people associate clearing with something that's bad or something that's negative and it's really not the case so thousands of students every year gain their university place through clearing okay and clearing is there really as sort of a another opportunity so you've got UCAS extra but then you also have um, clearing as well so clearing up for students who have not got into their firm or insurance choice. So obviously you, from your five choices, you narrow down to two, and let's just say it's unsuccessful on both of those, you're then entered into clearing. So then you're free to phone up um, as many universities as you like, have a look at their courses, have a look at their entry criteria, and work out whether you actually meet the criteria that they're asking for. So what Ben was talking about in terms of being alert, being prepared, that is what he was referring to. So make sure you have your results at hand, make sure you understand what universities are offering that course um, that you wanna do. It's important to note that if you've been um, unsuccessful with a university on a specific course, you can then not reapply through clearing at that same course and that same university. So it's very, very important that you understand that. So you will have to make a change somewhere or you could be in a position where you've got your results back you're having a look at your firm you're having a look at your insurance and you're thinking you know what i don't want to go to either of these and then all you need to do is phone up whatsapp whatever it may be get in touch with the uni new university see if they've got any spaces and see whether you're eligible for an offer so on the actual day you can actually phone up as many universities as you like you can get as many offers as you like from all different places, all different institutions, but you can only accept one. So you must not be holding an offer elsewhere um, in order to accept your new offer. And to accept the new offer, it's done via UCAS track. So remember I said you, you will be, you'll be using UCAS throughout this whole 
journey. So if you come through clearing, you will be using UCash Track to update your details in terms of the new offer that you want to go to. You're going to need your, obviously, you're going to need your UCAS ID number. You're going to need to have a look at um, the different university clearing guides, have a look at their entry criteria, and just to make sure that you're eligible. Usually speaking, we'll give you around 24 hours to, to confirm our offer. So our offer will be valid for 24 hours. And then it's up to you to make that decision to accept it by going on to UCash Track and update it. Remember from there, if you do utilize um, clearing, you will need to make changes to your accommodation, obviously, if your institution has changed, and you will need to update your student finance. But you will be advised of that over the phone when you speak to a university representative. And as Ben said, we've got many channels of the way that we do that, and our phone lines do open relatively early. Lovely. And I think that is everything in a in a nutshell running from UCAS. Uh, so the introduction to UCAS, if nobody, if, if people are sort of unsure as to what UCAS was, talking a little bit about research, obviously we mentioned the application process, the personal statement, and then we've sort of tied it all off with those additional routes to getting those offers through UCAS Extra um, and then obviously through clearing. So I think that's everything. I don't think we've missed anything. Have we have we missed anything, anything from you guys? Not like there's no so. No. Well, there we go. So that is the fast track to UCAS for those that were unsure. Uh, again, depending on where you are uh, in the process, this was a, a real run through of everything that's kind of going on. And as I say, we are going to be running other live streams covering um, sort of future topics. Uh, so we're going to hopefully cover student finance as, uh, as the student finance date sort of opens up and that opens up online. So do make sure you keep checking the website for other streams like this if you would like us to run through any other processes that are very similar to obviously the UCAS process today. Um, as mentioned, the reason why we've checked this in here uh, after Christmas is the UCAS deadline has suddenly uh, changed, obviously due to the ongoing pandemic that's been pushed back to give students and universities that little bit more time uh, in terms of processing. So you have got until the end of January, January 29th, um, to complete your application. If you are thinking of going to university, do so uh, fairly soon. You've got a little bit more time to think about it. But that's it from us. Uh, we've covered everything from the UCAS side of things. But if you have any other additional questions, we have got an inquiry team. You can email them, you can phone them, you can WhatsApp them. If you've got any questions at all about the whole process or about your offers or anything like that, drop them a line and they are a friendly bunch of people uh, and they will be able to obviously give you some more advice um, via those platforms. So do make sure you utilize that. And if you are thinking of coming to DMU or want to find out more about our courses, as Dal mentioned earlier as well, we have got an open day. So do uh, tune into that because that is coming up this Saturday and there's gonna be lots of really good stuff about the courses that we offer on there. But I hope everybody has a lovely evening. I hope you'll stay safe and we will see you at the next live stream. Take care everyone.